The decade into which I was born could be argued as one of industrial anarchy and violence. By 1979 and following the winter of discontent, it was commonly accepted that the promised cure for the British disease, the decline in industrial productivity, the increasing number of strikes, and the poor relationship between government, management and unions had failed. This national context filtered through to me by way of images from the mainstream media and through the attitudes of those around me who all seemed to have an opinion about the turmoil the country faced. As the son of a charge hand and a part-time munitions shift worker and one who attended an inner city comprehensive school, I was not educated via exposure to fine arts or critical literature. Images of conflict, home and abroad, were absorbed through grainy colour television pictures and tabloid press photographs which, by their nature, tended towards the sensational. As expressed by Sontag, being a spectator of calamities is a quintessential modern experience. Wars are now also living room sights and sounds. If it bleeds, it leads, under the venerable guideline of tabloids and 24-hour headline news shows. The Falklands War in 1982 was a talking point on our school playground, and I vividly remember my peers at eight or nine years old expressing fear about the war, perhaps frightened like me by exposure to news reports of, for example, Bluff Cove. The same year the provisional Irish Republican Army detonated bombs in Hyde Park and Regent's Park, killing 11 British soldiers and injuring many spectators. In 1984, just after the start of a new school term, my junior school teachers wheeled a large screen television into the assembly hall to play a recording of Michael Burke's report on the famine in Ethiopia. Lines of children aged between 9 to 11 sat in silence at the horror and desperation of parents carrying their dying children. I reflect now that in my formative years I was exposed to images and narratives that presented the world as one in conflict. Parallel to these national and global events, by the early 1980s, the suspicion that the police may not have been as honourable as the public had naively assumed was present in the British psyche, perhaps influenced by novels such as The Burden of Proof and So You Bastard, questioning the commonly accepted demarcation of the line between villain and citizen. An investigation by journalists working for the Times in 1969 uncovered three separate occurrences of detectives accepting bribes from criminals in order that they stayed in business. Headlines such as this led a sway in public opinion about the trustworthiness of the service established to protect communities and individuals from crime. In a kind of anarchistic parallel, by the late 1970s, skinhead culture mutated from working-class, fashion-conscious youths from London to nationwide organised gangs who committed violence on ethnic groups as a form of social and cultural protest. This national unease was evident in my own upbringing and, echoing the thoughts of others I grew up with, I had little faith in the possibility of protection from the authorities should they be required, adding to a sense of vulnerability at a time of significant social, political and economic decline. I feared the police as a purveyor of violence, the images of the miners' strikes in 1984 and the poll tax riots in 1990 serving to validate this view. Between 1943 and 2006, public information films were supplied to UK broadcasters free of charge to use at their discretion and were intentionally aimed at the younger generation to raise awareness about the potential dangers of, say, fireworks, strangers, lake ponds. The public information films aimed at children from 1973 featured the animation Charlie Says, affected by a huge increase in British independent film production, which exploited the horror genre to terrifying effect. Well intended, these films tackled health and safety subjects in a manner which appeared at first childish and comical, but masked a darker and more sinister undertone. Whilst they were written for children, they were made by adults and because of that they reflected the vulnerability and violence of 1970s and 1980s Britain, a place where strangers would kidnap the young and playing out with friends came with a risk that you may never return home safely. On occasion, merely changing the channel did not bring any relief from what has been suggested as the most terrifying decade to grow up in. 
the BBC's remake of The Boy From Space, a series of low-budget educational sci-fi, has been reviewed by several online bloggers under the new critical theory of hauntology, with online content being largely devoted to the analysis of 1970s children's fiction. By the time of the televised Heysel Stadium disaster in 1985, where 39 football fans lost their life, my perception of my town, and indeed the world as one punctuated by societal and state violence at home and abroad, was established. Whilst it appears the complexity of the UK's social issues, such as mass migration, the threat of terrorism and public service austerity measures, can currently be evaluated using a range of new media outlets, such as citizen journalism, the tabloid reporting on societal issues such as segregation appears consistent with the aforementioned. The Daily Mail's 2016 report into racial division in Blackburn on the front line of segregation UK, sought to ignore almost all the efforts of the community to celebrate its diversity, and instead presents key phrases such as haunted by segregation, dominated by hilltop mosques, and most racially segregated community. In opposition, perhaps, to the production of nostalgic images, journalistic representations of Blackburn have focused on a narrow range of visual tropes through which to identify a cultural problem such as racism, social isolation or religious fundamentalism. Whilst the troubles in Northern Ireland clearly do not compare to those of present-day Blackburn, this period assists in providing a perspective on how the media sensationalises. It was commonplace in 1970s Northern Ireland for photographers to be airlifted in via helicopter and then flown out once the riot or disturbance was over. McCullen's photograph of the tear gas attack in the Little Diamond area of Derry describes the intensity and violence of what the Sunday Times in 1971 called War on the Home Front. In contrast, Paul Searight's photographs from the 1990s show us another side to the impact of conflict. The locally produced defensive architecture from North Belfast, illustrating how conflict affects the everyday lives away from the eye of the media, essentially what division and conflict looks like to those who live there. Seemingly, the challenge for directors and photographers, those charged or commissioned to produce articles or documentaries that highlight the social ills of towns such as Blackburn, seems to be that they are struggling to develop a new, accurate visual language for the diverse post-industrial, some would say post-working class, communities such as those who live in Blackburn. They wrestle with the notion of the North as a locale of regeneration and optimism, Rather, they seem stuck in the language of the past, the industrial toil, the unemployment, or the ghettos of the 1960s. This is not to diminish the real problems that deindustrialized towns like Blackburn face. They are as vulnerable to social issues as other towns in England and across the UK. But the Blackburn has been a focus for these issues in the mainstream media more recently. It's particularly concerning for those of us who contribute positively to its transformation or at least improvement. In fact, during the recent Panorama broadcast in January this year, even Ted Cantle, author of the Cantle Report in 2001, expressed his sympathy that Blackburn was feeling the full force of the media's attention on matters such as community cohesion. And in the context of my own PhD research, I was motivated to respond. Therefore, I considered how I could be led, educated, influenced and informed by a wider consensus about Blackburn today. I reflected that what was required was a democratic starting point, one that could provide me with a commonly agreed list of Blackburn, an itinerary of places, streets and sites of significance. Interestingly, the notion of nostalgia becomes extremely important in this context. Traditionally, nostalgia termed by Swiss doctors in the 17th century to describe what they thought to be a medical condition, is associated with a wistful yearning to return to a bygone age, often filtered through rose-tinted memories of the past. My previous experiments had been an attempt to return to the past, to recall memories and extract them, to analyse them through the use of photography and autobiographical writing. As Bradbury describes it, my nostalgic approach was arguably a yearning to return, 
but also an attempt to dwell upon Blackburn's longer-term past. In a holistic sense, it seems this was a strategy, albeit not always consciously, of attempting to describe the indescribable, which in turn mirrors closely the practice of photography. The photograph mediates time, immobilising a moment and reducing it to a two-dimensional representation of an event, location, circumstance or person. In effect, the photograph can never represent the present, the moment encapsulated as past, never to be experienced again. By the morning of 16th of September 2017, I had produced some new photographs of Blackburn. The link to the foreign, perhaps to the exotic, can be found in Corporation Park, a photograph I made in August 2017 of Blackburn's Victorian Glass Conservatory. It now seems significant that I chose a photograph that visualises the contrasting themes of municipality, empire and decay. After all, this was how I interpreted the park at that time, a gloomy, practical place that had seen better days, one that harked back to a more exuberant and poetic time, now a place for local dog walkers and those who use it as a shortcut to get to work. In contrast, the occasion of the park's opening, the 22nd of October 1857, was attended by 65 to 70,000 people. The population at that time was only 85,000 people. Shops and mills closed for the afternoon to allow the locals to celebrate their new public park. And three days before the park was officially opened, William Billington, a Blackburn poet, wrote a sonnet to commemorate not only the occasion, but the park itself. Where land and water formed as fair a scene as ever slept beneath the soft serene, autumnal heavens or blush beneath the smile of rosy spring who robes the earth in green. The park's conservatory was opened in 1902 and was constructed to house exotic plants from across the British Empire. This summer though, as I photographed the rotten iron and through the vandalised glass windows, damp with the typical wet summer of East Lancashire, I was reminded of my time spent in the conservatory as a young boy. I remembered the heat inside, the looming, magnificent palm trees with their spiky leaves. It was my closest physical experience to the jungle, the other experiences omitted from film and television. In short, I felt sadness at what the conservatory had become and felt responsible to present it as I experienced it. Intrigue, nostalgia and melancholy. The link to my earlier research between 2015 and 2016, which attempted to utilise ethnographic and anthropological frameworks as influence on my practice, is evident in this approach. Yet whilst my photography isn't anthropological or ethnographic in the sense of an informed position within the discipline, it does provide documentary evidence that communicates realities integral to human experience. For example, Wainwright Bridge, captures not only the denoted mechanical construction itself, but furthermore it constructs a cultural panorama. What is the impact, aesthetic or physical, of this structure on both the land and on those people that live near or under the cover it provides, or the light which it emits? Relatedly, the absence of human beings in such photographs does not result in the absence of a human footprint, presence or experience. I argue that the inclusion of people in photographs such as these can render the theme of man and environment less comprehensible. By this I refer to the notion that in still photography, as opposed to, say, the frenetic nature of film, there are no other distractions to interfere with the scene as it has been rendered. No other foreign body will enter the frame. One is free to reflect, to analyse, to critique the photograph, knowing that no new elements will subsequently appear. A still photograph will always be so. When people are included within the camera's frame, they become representative of the context of the photograph. For example, Margaret Bort White's Louisville, Kentucky, January 1937. Or they become a measure of scale. For example, Carlton Watkins, Cape Horn, Columbia River, 1867. I suggest that the visual strategy employed in the making of these photographs encourages the viewer to immerse themselves in the landscape more readily given that they are on their own within these places. All Hallows Spring, arguably the most important place in Blackburn, a place of pilgrimage, worship and well-being since at least the Iron Age. This site is located underneath the old Telegraph building. 
behind the Adelphi Hotel to the east of Blackburn Cathedral. It is at basement level, in an area that businesses use to store their bins and to park their company vehicles. When this spring was unearthed and excavated, statues and sculptures were found dedicated to the building of a Roman temple in York and likely placed there by the 6th Legion of Vitrix. This was the same legion who were sent to Britain in AD 119 by the Emperor Hadrian to secure the region and fight in battles further north. What I learned from this image and from my research into it is that there are places that should be visible to us all, they are part of our heritage, and I question what this place, this site would look like if this was in Florence or Bologna, not Blackburn. At the very least, it's reassuring that Blackburn's past of one of migrant transition, shifting demographic, even the exotic, is not rooted just in the 1970s or indeed 2018. In light of the recent Panorama programme, White Fright, A Town Divided, perspective here is, I believe, very important. It was not then a surprise that the visual aesthetic of the photographs from this latest experiment varied from earlier works, these latest photographs were taken under shifting conditions and described contrasting landscapes. The photographs were taken under warm skies and selenium tinted street lighting. The views took me through complex structures and over quiet paved courtyards. Thus I concluded after several weeks of making photographs of Blackburn between September and November 2017 that my aim of visually mapping Blackburn through an extracted location list from the town's Wikipedia article achieved something distinct to that of previous experiments. I set out in one sense to establish parameters which would support me to reimagine my hometown, to put aside my historical connections and thus produce visual outcomes motivated by the definition of others. However, this time I had chosen a route which would lead me to counter my own narrative and this became fundamental, as the core aim of the research had been to counter existing narratives by others.